follow through. If you've ever had a coach or ever played a sport, you've probably heard that simple little secret for improving your performance. You have to follow through. And so Tiger will tell you, if you could talk to him, a good follow through will put a golf ball in the hole instead of in the bushes or in the lake. A proper follow through is the difference between a home run and a foul ball. And so whether it's football or it's basketball or even dodgeball, you have to follow through. And if the counsel there is really not clear for some in the room still, let me read the definition out of the dictionary. Follow through, it says it's the concluding part of a sports stroke after a ball or other object has been hit or released. And I know some of you are visual learners rather than verbal, and so I brought uh, my tennis racket here for you guys to see here tonight. Now this is a very good tennis racket, but don't make the mistake of thinking that I'm good at tennis. I'm not. Uh, but this is the thing. I got a lot better when my wife gave me one little tennis tip, which is she said, Scott, you're, you're choking your stroke. You're, you're, you're stopping as soon as you hit the, the ball. You know, you come in contact with that ball and you, and you stop the stroke. You have to follow through all the way through. Now, unfortunately, it didn't help me beat her. Uh, she has continued to beat me, and so I gave up the game. But I kept the racket there just for an illustration. But she said, you know, without a full stroke, you're not going to have uh, power. You're not going to have accuracy. You're not going to have consistency. You've got to have that follow through and going all the way through the swing. And what that shows us is that what happens after the contact is just as important, maybe even more important in some ways, than what comes before the contact. Now, at first, you might wonder if you think it through, and, and I like to do that. How can what happens after I hit the ball make any difference on where the ball goes? I mean, isn't it true that I've already hit it and it's gone? But the truth is, it does. Follow through makes all of the difference. And the reason is that before and after are really not separable. They're really not things that you can say, oh, well, that's not important after, because they're really just one continuous whole. A correct form in any sport requires a completed action, start to finish. And so any coach that you have will tell you the same thing. You have to follow through. You have to complete the action from start to finish. And the result will be power, accuracy, and consistency. Now, follow through is certainly important in the sports world, but it's even more important in the spiritual realm. And so tonight we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And you can kind of picture Paul maybe in his coaching outfit there, coaching the Christians in Corinth, and this is what he's saying, listen team, it's all about follow through. It's all about that. If we're going to reach our spiritual potential individually and collectively, we have to learn to follow through. And so Paul was counseling the Corinthians there to complete their commitments, to perform their promises, to turn their verbal vows into actual action, and to follow things from start all the way through to finish. And he was addressing an area that I believe is particularly difficult to follow through in. For many, for myself, for others, it's the area of finances. Now, as you'll soon see in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, these are some of the most direct Bible chapters on that subject, the subject of money and giving. And right away, I know some of you at least are thinking the following thing. You're thinking, oh, I get it. I get it. See, I know what you're doing. You want to make sure that everybody in the room follows through with their commitments, uh, with the impact uh, the weekend and the building life project and all that stuff. And so you and Pastor Pedro, way back at the beginning of the year, you carefully timed these two teachings here in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 to come right after that weekend. Now, this is a newsflash maybe for some of you. I really can't speak for Pedro, but you know what? I'm not that smart. I wish I were that smart. I wish we were that clever. But God is that smart. And so what I see over and over again is that God has his perfect timing. And I believe that he has planned us to hit this chapter, this section of Scripture, right at the right time as we're being challenged as a church. And I include myself in that, to rise up and build and to fulfill those things that God has called us to faithfully. And so certainly it's true that many of us, have made financial commitments to the Building Life Project. And that's good, but this is what it's saying. Now it's time to follow through with those commitments. And that can be so often the more difficult thing. And here's the important part to see, I think, for us tonight. That the principle of follow through is not just financial. See, it, that's 
where you start to realize that this application in this scripture goes so much further than just the financial commitments that the Corinthians made or that we might make. And spiritually speaking, learning to follow through faithfully will affect every area of your life. Your relationships with family, your relationships with friends, your relationship with the Lord. It's going to affect your ministry, whatever that might be. God has a ministry for every Christian, a place of service, a finding of their fit, and there's going to be a usefulness, there's going to be a fruitfulness in a person's life when they learn to follow through. It'll affect your marriage, that's for sure. It'll affect your workplace and learning to follow through. Again, it's going to make such a radical difference and change for the, your life in the better in every area of life. And so follow through. We have to learn it. We need to learn it. And when we do, we'll find that we're living with that power, that consistency, that accuracy. And if we fail to follow through, if we don't learn this lesson, we may have all kinds of good intentions in life, but very little at the end of our life to show for it. And we don't want that to happen. And so let's take a look at what God's word has to say about the subject of follow through as we look at it here in 2 Corinthians 8. Look at verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, we make it known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Now, that's another way of saying that they were generous. Now, thinking about some principles here, we're going to look at four principles of follow-through. Through, Through uh, this study here, we're going to look at four different aspects of what it means to learn to follow through in every area of life. And of course, the example that Paul is using here is financial, but as I mentioned, it applies much wider than that. But principle number one is this, giving follows getting. Giving follows getting. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, just this. Getting, see, the getting that I'm talking about here specifically is getting God's grace. It's something that every person on the planet needs to make sure that they're doing. Four times in these first nine verses of this chapter, you're going to see the word grace, in, and it's mentioned directly in the context of giving. And God is a giver. We know that. The reason is he's a lover, and, and loving and giving always go together. And so you see the greatest gift he could give any person is his grace, which is his unmerited favor. It means he loves us because he loves us. And he gives us stuff because he wants to, because he desires to, not because we deserve it or anything else. And so that's the part that really comes first in a person's life, coming into contact. Remember that thing about uh, coming into contact, the before and after and all that? Well, the coming into contact with Christ, that's when a person could say, hey, I've got God's grace. This is awesome. Now what? Well, when it comes to God's grace, we need to follow through. See, there's the second part of that picture there, and that is that giving follows getting. And remember that analogy. There's the part that comes before. There's the part that comes after. And so you have to come into contact with Christ first before any of this that I'm talking about tonight will even make any sense at all. You have to get God's grace. And of course, it's freely available and Tonight's a great night. If you've never come into contact with Christ by faith and said, I want him to be my Lord. I want him to be my Savior. I want him to be my friend. Well, tonight's an opportunity to do that at the end there. But if you try to give or live without first getting God's grace, you're going to find yourself very frustrated. It's not going to work. You won't have anything to give. Why? Because every good thing comes from God. And so then the second part of that that we talk about is once you get God's grace, what does God want you to do with that? Well, he wants you to give God's grace, to follow through. And as always, giving follows getting. And again, the principle goes far beyond the financial. First, we get from God. And the Bible talks about some of the things that we can get from God. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control, all of these incredible things that we need in life. All a result of God's grace. No other way to get those things. Not through human effort or trying a little bit harder or any of that. But the mistake that many make is that they will get God's grace and they think it stops there. They don't follow through to the natural, or should I say supernatural, conclusion of the matter. And that's one reason that Paul here was helping the Corinthians, coaching the Corinthians. And he's saying to the church there, you know what? An offering for the needy in Jerusalem. That's what he was talking about. There was a famine that had gone on. We see that in the book of Acts. 
There was persecution that went on. Paul was even part of that problem at one point in his life. And so the Jerusalem church, the Jews there, were in really desperate times. And so Paul went around to the different Gentile churches and said, hey, you know, would it be in your hearts to help? Would, it, would there be something willing inside you that you would say, wow, God's given us so much grace that we would give some grace back in whatever way we could. And so, verse 1, verse 2, Paul tells the Corinthian church that something really great and graceful was going on in their neighbors to the north. That's Macedonia. That's where it's comparing it there in that sense. And it says that the Macedonians are following through. He's just using an example, and any coach will do this. They watch tapes. They see uh, former players, and they see people who are doing it right, and they say, watch that guy. That guy's got a good stroke. That's the kind of follow-through you want to have. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He's saying these Macedonians right up the road, man, they got God's grace. And you know what? As a result, they gave generously in spite of their own challenges. This is so important to see in this. It says in verse 2 that they were undergoing themselves a great trial of affliction. Deep poverty. You know, it's not like they were abounding in many things and said, well, hey, we'll help the Jerusalem church. We got so much, we don't know what to do with it. No, they said, hey, we know what it, it's like to have hardships, so, you know, we'll help if we can. And so that's a true sign of God's grace going on right there, as you see it in verse 1. It says, the grace of God was bestowed upon them. That's how that happened. And one of the surest signs, I believe, in a person's life that they really have embraced God's grace is that be, they become a grace giver, that they become a person who is looking for how they can return to God some favor for what all the favor that he has found for them. And, and the end of the story is this, that God really doesn't need anything. He has need of nothing, and, and yet there's so many needy in the world. And so this is one of the ways that it's just a very normal and natural and supernatural part of the Christian life. And so using whatever gifts you have, whatever they might be, if they're uh, time, treasures, talents, whatever they might be, for the glory of God, for the benefit of others, that is an outpouring of God's grace. And it's kind of like we were able to say, listen, I have been given, and so I can be giving. That's how it's going to work. I've been forgiven, so I can be forgiving. See, it's first you get from God, and that's the only way you have anything to give. And people who try to give without first getting grace from God, well, they're going to find out they can't do it for very long. But that's a, a, a response there to say, I want to give what I have received. And that's what you see happening in the Macedonians. And they were receivers of God's grace very clearly because they were givers of God's grace. And God knows this, that hoarding will never make us happy. See, a lot of times the world sends us that message. If you want to be happy, just hoard. Find more for me, that sort of thing. And that's the sign of a graceless life. You know, trying to fill our lives with all of the things that we think are going to make us happy when it's in fact only God that can fill the hole in our heart. And so a real selfishness is a sign of a person who has not received grace. But a grace-filled life, that's a person who is already fulfilled by God. And so they become selfless. And that's why Jesus said, hey, it's more blessed to give than receive. And he wasn't, again, just talking about financial things. Certainly to give of ourselves is even more important than to just give a check out of our wallet or something like that. And so our daughter, I, I was just really pleased. The other day, she came up to us. She's seven years old. And, you know, kids are naturally selfish. They get it through their, through their moms mostly. But, <laughs> but it's... Um, and their fathers too. But, but you see, uh, Carissa, seven years old, she came up to us out of the blue. She didn't know what I was going to teach on or anything else. And she just said to me, you know what? To us, getting is good, but giving is better. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Giving is, is better. Getting is good. Giving is better. And so giving is not God's way of raising cash. It's not that he's short on cash and he needs it. It's his way of raising kids. It's his way of raising his kids, freed from greed, knowing that we're going to find fulfillment, not in getting, 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 but any getting that we get that we would be able to give from that. And so that's the follow through, and that giving follows getting. Grace, once you've got it, you got to give it. You got to give it. It's the way it works. And so verse 3, it says, I bear witness that according to their ability, yeah, and even beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. Now, again, Paul as a coach is just saying, hey, look at the form that's going on 
over here. Verse 4, he says, imploring us with much urgency. I think it's interesting. That's a word for really begging. You know, this is somebody begging. But notice it's not Paul pressuring the Macedonians for their money. It's not Paul begging them to give. No, it's the Macedonians begging Paul to allow them to give, to receive their offering. It's like they're saying, pretty please here. Paul, take it. Come on, come on. Don't say no to us. Don't give us the excuse that, hey, you guys can't afford this. Listen, we want to do it. We're willing to do it. We insist. And I remember several years ago, something that happened in my life that just underlined this kind of situation so much in an unforgettable way. Some of you may have even been standing there for it. But it was after a service, and we were outside with a group, you know, just kind of the last few before the gate gets closed and all that kind of stuff when the service is over and everyone's just sitting around chatting. And a man rode up on a kind of beat-up old bicycle, and he was wearing dirty clothes, you know, and all the rest. And, and uh, you know, I would love to, th to tell you that pastors never have certain thoughts in their heads or preconceived notions of things or whatever, and we're just all so super spiritual that we never have these thoughts. But, but this person pulled up, you know, on the bike, and I was kind of like, oh, no, I'm about ready to go, you know, I'm kind of in a hurry and stuff. And, and so the guy said, hey, can I speak with a pastor? I'm like, oh, man. And people pointed at me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yes. Hi, Pastor Scott, how are you? And I was ready to hear, as I have many times, a sad story and, and, and a request for help and that sort of thing. And of course, uh, overall, we're, we're just happy to do that stuff and everything else. But here's, here's the thing. This is what I heard. Totally shocked me. He said, Pastor, will you receive an offering for the Lord? I, I said, uh, yeah, it, that's fine. He says, the building locked up, or can I, can I still give an offering? He said, it's not much. And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out 80 cents in change. And he said, I just made eight bucks mowing a lawn, and this is my tithe. And I was like, Whew. I drove home in my car, and I was like, Lord, I am such a loser. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you know, you made me a pastor so that I could learn these lessons and to learn them well and, and maybe someday teach them as I'm learning them. And here's the thing. Something giving is reserved for the rich, you know. It's, and rich is defined as someone who makes more money than we do, right? Whoever is rich, it's certainly not us. But he says, look up the road at the Macedonians here, folks. They had deep poverty. They had difficult trials. And yet, as they were getting God's grace and they were giving God's grace, what was the result? Abundance of joy, it says right there. Seems like a real strange combo. But that's what follow through is all about. When a person has that getting and giving with God, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so I've traveled a lot, and I've traveled into the third world, and if you've ever done that, you know that sometimes the people who have the very least have the most joy and have the most generosity. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, you see people begging, but I've also had people beg to allow, for me to allow them to give me something, some gift. And I'm like, Come on. You know, I, I, I literally have been in a house where the person had dirt floors and no windows and they wanted to give me something. And I'm like, come on. But that's the joy that comes with it. They're, they, it would have been a dishonor to say no to them. And so where God's grace is, even in the most humble home, even in the most difficult time, there can be joy. And when we first moved to Miami, my, my wife volunteered as a crossing guard, and we learned lessons through all of these things. I love how God teaches us not just through his word, but through the world, you know, teaches us things. And there as a crossing guard, she came home one day and said, Scott, I've seen a pattern, you know. There's fancy cars and people with fancy clothes and all the rest, and inside so often it's sad and stressed out parents and kids, no time for a hug, you know, got to throw them out the door, the kid doesn't even look back, that sort of thing. And then along comes an old car, you know, paint peeling off, dent in the door, all that kind of stuff, windows down, no AC, but everyone's smiling. Everyone's having a great time, big kisses and hugs and all the rest. Now, am I romanticizing poverty? No, it's not always an easy thing. But so often as parents, we make that mistake where we say, you know, I want to give my kids everything I never had, like, like uh, Pedro says, you know, like straight A's. But, <laughs> you know, I want to give my kids everything. But you know what the best thing I can give my kids as a parent? Well, I can give them parents that love the Lord and each other. That's going to be something good. Loving the kids and being a parent who gets and gives grace, that's going to be something very 
very powerful, an attitude of gratitude that they would be able to look on and say, hey, we may not have everything, but we have everything that matters. And so verse 5, he says, not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. And I love this in verse 5. It's such an important principle. It's the second one we look at here tonight. It's that loving others follows loving God. Loving others follows loving God. This is the follow through that's going on here. Now, I would say if I were to talk with you individually, most of you in the room would say, you know what? I love God. You say, all right, that's cool. But what about follow through? You know, that's when you say, okay, now i got to love others. Now I get to love others. Oh, that's a little different, isn't it? I mean, God is so lovable. You know, just me and God. But loving people, that can be a little more of a challenge. But loving God's people and loving the lost, well, that is going to follow from loving God. That's the follow-through. That's the second part of the stroke there. And I do a lot of relationship counsel as a pastor, and I love doing that, but I use an illustration that... Uh, is, I believe, very helpful, which is that of a spinning top. You know, spinning a top on the table there, and you say, you know what? Here's the thing. If the vertical axis of that top is straight, everything goes very smoothly. But if you get that vertical axis out of alignment, all of a sudden the thing wobbles all over the place and goes right off the table and is out of control, spinning out of control. And so often people come into my office because their life, their relationships with others are spinning out of control. And we always come back to this, hey, how's the vertical axis in your life? How is the vertical axis, the connection between you and God, the relationship between you and God? Because it's funny how when that one is going really, really well, other things just seem to fall into place. But if you get that one out of alignment, all of a sudden you're wobbling all over the place, all kinds of friction and problems with people, and you start saying, there's something wrong with my relationships with people. I say, well, let's talk about the vertical axis. Let's talk about the fact that it says loving others here is a follow-on to loving God. And if you think about that, remember what Paul said to the, about the Macedonians there. He said they were freely willing, even ab- above their ability, even beyond their ability. You know, there was, they, they wanted to do even more than they could do. And he was saying there that they were in a difficult time, but they were more concerned with others than they were with themselves. And that is a big issue right there. And how does this happen? Well, it happens with that little priority that you see in verse 5. It's such a simple thing, but it's so profound. It says they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us. And what is it saying? It's saying they first got the vertical axis very, very strong and straight. And what do you know? They were then able to give themselves fully to others And things went very smoothly, even in the midst of great trouble for them. They first fell in love with God, and that gave them the power and the consistency and the accuracy and the ability to fall in love with others, even when others are not so lovable. And see, if you get this in the wrong order, and so often people do, over time, you'll burn out. You'll wipe out. You'll say, I'm just going to try to love the people around me. It's all about love, right? But the first thing is to give yourself so fully to the Lord. Well, as you do that, as you give yourself first to God, you'll be able to give yourself second to others. And other priorities will take care of themselves so often in your life. And so in the next section, you see verse 6. It moves from the example of the Macedonians here over to the Corinthians. He, he's going to concentrate on them now, and he talks about a guy named Titus, as you'll see in verse 6. One of the leaders that was there placed in Corinth, and this is what Paul says, listen, I urged Titus, verse 6, as he begun, so he would complete. You see how the theme throughout this whole chapter is about follow through. He says, he began, now let's go ahead and finish it all the way through. And he says, verse 6, we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. What grace? Well, the grace of giving. He says, but as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Now, you may remember if you were here for the studies uh, in 1 Corinthians that Corinth was a a well-known place for a number of reasons. Some of them good, some of them bad. But they were really known for their worldly wealth. It was a seaport. It was a prosperous place. You know, it was a place where a lot of business took place and they basically uh, were doing very well. Unlike Jerusalem, where the 
believers were really strongly persecuted, in many ways in Corinth, Corinth just kind of ignored them. They're like, whatever, you know, do what you want to do. And so anything goes in Corinth, and so the Christians really weren't under heavy, heavy persecution there. But the church in Corinth was famous, or maybe in a way infamous, for their spiritual gifts in excess. I mean, they were like, we're so loving, we love to swing from the rafters, man. That's what we do. We're swinging from the chandeliers, and our services are just out of control. And sometimes people will ask us here, you know, call on the phone, are you a charismatic church? And I always go, I don't know really how to answer that. Should I answer that biblically, or, or how should I answer that, you know? Corinth was charismatic. In many ways, they were charismaniacs, in a way. But the word charismania, or charismatic, I'm sorry, actually comes from the Greek word charis, charis. And that's, we named our daughter Carissa after their, that name. It means grace. But all throughout the scripture, he's saying, hey, this is a gift. God gives different gifts, spiritual gifts, all kinds of different gifts, you know, and, and we've talked about many of those things. But Paul's saying, hey, you guys are kind of hyper abounding in so many of these areas. And then he says, but there's one little area that you're not quite so hyper about. And he says, what about this grace? What about this grace gift here of giving? And the fullness of the Spirit, so many people think it's all about, you know, shaking and bacon and all these things. And, and really, what Paul's kind of putting the point on here is he says, you know what? One of the best ways that it's demonstrated that I'm full of the Spirit, that it's a Spirit-filled church, is that it would be a generous and giving church in every area. Because love, well, love gives. And so, verse 8, he says, I speak not by commandment. I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. He says, I'm just kind of putting it up against this pattern to say, is this a good follow-through or is this one that's got some room for improvement? And I love it because Paul's saying here, I'm not talking about a commandment here. You know, I'm not saying thou shalt do this. He's just saying, you know, you're going to be blessed if you do this. You're going to be glad if you do it. And there's definitely a connection between loving and giving. There's no way to separate those two. Nothing will make a guy spend money like water, like falling in love. You know, you can see a guy who's been a tightwad all his life, and then he falls in love, and all of a sudden it's big tips and all the rest, and, you know, giving the guy the thing at the, oh, valet, sure, valet, you know, and all that kind of thing. Whoa! Now, you think about this. You know, my wife didn't marry me for my money, and if she did, she married the wrong guy. But what if, what if I were to consistently over our marriage tell my wife, I love you, honey, I love you so much. But then she say, hey, listen, can I get $5 to go buy some lunch for the kids? Nope. Never going to spend any money on her. And as a matter of fact, I say, you know what? Um, you got to walk everywhere. Gas is just really getting too expensive. You know, it, it, well, okay, could I at least get some good walking shoes? No, nah, the old ones will do. You know, here's some sandals that I found out in the trash out there. You know, never able to give her anything. But this is the thing. Now you go out into the garage and there you see my Jeep. Oh wow, your Jeep's got some nice chrome on it. Yeah, man, big roof rack, saving up for some other stuff, got some accessories I want. You know, a big winch in the front, that kind of stuff in case, you know, four wheel in here in the, in the Miami area, some of the big hills and stuff, you know. Well, you might wonder at that point, she might wonder, does he love me? I mean, does he really mean what he says or does he love the Jeep? And so loving others follows loving God. And I would ask myself and others, hey, do you love God? Great. Then follow through. Love others. Get involved. Serve and give. And whatever God has given you, give yourself to God and then to others. And if ever there was a person who did that, who was a perfect example of it, who proved his love by his giving. It was Jesus. You see that in verse 9. This is a hidden gem, not so hidden, right in the middle of this chapter. And I would encourage you, circle this one and understand it. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now this is one of those verses that Preachers love to take out a context, and instead, I, I'm going to try and put it for us here tonight right into its proper context. First of all, Jesus was poor physically. You need to know that and understand it. I, I've heard people you know, come up with these crazy ideas about the fact that he had a seamless garment, and those were luxury clothing, and you go, no, 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 no. 
Let's look at it here. Born in a borrowed stable. Okay, he was born in a barn. If anybody ever says, what's the matter with you? Born in a barn because you don't have manners? He could have said, well, yeah, actually I was. In a feed trough. You know, His parents brought the sacrifice of the poor. When he was dedicated as a child, there were different sacrifices you could bring. They brought the poor sacrifice, just a couple of birds that could have been bought for a few cents. Now, you know they would have desperately liked to bring the greater sacrifice as they're here dedicating the Son of God. And it's like, what do you got? Well, we can afford the two doves. You know, that's it. Now, at one point, the Bible says that everyone went to his own home, but Jesus didn't have a home, so he went to the Mount of Olives, a place where he spent many nights under the stars, you know. And he had nowhere to lay his head, he said, many times. Uh, he was always borrowing things. Whenever he would give illustrations, he'd always say, listen, does anyone have a coin? You know, he didn't whip out his own wallet and say, hey, look at this. No, they asked him a tax question. He said, does anyone have a penny, uh, a coin that you could look at there? Borrowed a donkey to ride into town on for his big uh, moment, you know, his prophetic thing. Borrowed an upper room for the last supper, you know, the last meal with him. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, knew he wouldn't be needing it for long. But this is the important point, really, of the scripture, that Jesus became poor spiritually. See, all of that is kind of like big deal, you know. Okay, so he didn't have every luxury in life. But this is the thing. On the cross, he took the spiritual debt that every person has ever owed my spiritual bankruptcy and he put it on his back. That went to his account so that his spiritual riches could come to my account. And not only my sin, but the sin of the world, you know. Why? That I might be made rich. Oh, that I might have every luxury in life and wear fine clothes. Come on, that's such a dishonoring of the cross. You really think Jesus went to the cross so that we could live in the lap of luxury? No, he, he went to the cross because he wanted to take us from hell to heaven. That's what it's all about. And as I say that, I just want to make this point very, very clear. To preach that God has promised physical wealth and health to every believer, every Christian. That's a distortion of scripture. Ephesians 1.3 says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, by his grace, many of us do enjoy many physical riches as well. But the thing is, no matter how rich you are physically, if you're bankrupt spiritually, you are poor. And so Paul, like any spiritual coach here, he points to the best possible example and says, hey, there's the life to look at. You want to see what follow through is all about? This is a guy who is willing to do it from start to finish, to do whatever was necessary, that he was able on the cross to say, it is finished. I've followed through. What? In the transaction that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's true riches. But loving others follows loving God. And if you ever have trouble loving others, people who don't deserve it. Just come back here and think on verse 9, that Jesus became so poor that I might become rich. Rich in what? Rich in God's grace so that I not only get it, but I'm able to give it. That I'm not only forgiven, but I can be forgiving for his sake. And so, you see, it gives us the grace to follow through and love others willingly. Now, again, not a command, but he says it in verse 10. I love it. I give advice. That's what he's saying. I, it's to your advantage. I'm coaching you. I want you to reach your spiritual potential. Learn to follow through. That's what Paul's saying. Verse 10, he says, In this, I give advice. It's to your advantage, not only to be doing what you began. I isn't that interesting? He's saying, this, this is for your good. He says, to do what you began and were desiring to do a year ago. That's how much time had passed between the promise and right now. And he says, and now you must complete the doing of it that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there may be a completion out of what you have. Now, this is the third principle that we hit tonight. It's that doing follows willing. Doing follows willing. Now, being willing is wonderful, right? I mean, that's a good thing. It's a good first step. I mean, if you're not willing, you're not going to be doing, that's for sure. But being willing is only part of it. It's no substitute for actually doing. See, the Corinthians there, they'd made all kinds of promises. They had heard about a need. They had heard about something that was going on. 
And as time passed, well, they just kind of, you know, their enthusiasm waned, and it can happen to all of us. That is something that is common to the human condition. You know, the kind of, hey, one of these days, you know, I, I am going to do that, and I really want to do that, and somehow I just never actually do. And I talked with a friend who ran a marathon recently. Now, he had been talking about this for years. Now, you know, different times he'd say, no, I, I, one of these days, one of these days, he actually did it. He actually did it. He actually crossed the finish line. You know what he told me? He said, man, I was so willing at the beginning, but by the end, it was just an act of the will. It was just one of these things where I asked God for the grace to take another step and somehow made it across that line. He said, well, there I did it. But it's so easy to start. He said, you know, there were a whole lot more people at the starting line than there were at the finish line. And, and, and that's so easy. Hey, it's easy to start a marathon. Anyone want to go start a marathon? Well, one step. Hey, I started. I'm done. You know, where's the t-shirt? But Finish. Finishing. And again, Paul gives some advice. I give some advice. I, I like to share this one with as many people as I can. It's better to under-promise and over-deliver in life than to over-promise and under-deliver. Ever met a person who over-promises? Yeah, they'll promise you, oh, I'll do, I will, I shall, I, yes. But then they under-deliver. And I try never to promise what, by God's grace, I can't definitely do. What, what I can't say, yeah, I will definitely do that. As a parent, as a friend, as a spouse, as an employee, all the way through life, you know, it's so easy to say yes to people and then not follow through. But as we'll see, the Corinthians had such good intentions when it came to giving. Back in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul let them know, and they said, man, that's a good opportunity. That's a God opportunity. We want to be a part of it. Yeah, you can count on us, Paul. They made their promises. We're with you, buddy. And this is the problem. Time passed and there was no follow through, no completion, no action, no indication really here at all that the Corinthians were intentionally negligent, that they were, you know, failing to follow through on purpose where they promised and say, we ain't never going to do that. No, they wanted to do it. But it's likely that what happened in their life happens so often in ours, which is that we simply get busy. We simply get so many other priorities that push things out of the way and get otherwise occupied, and life gets in the way. And Jesus commented on this in such a practical way for us. He was talking about a parable of four soils, and we were looking at it with the kids the other day at our house, and, and it just reminded me of it. If you want to jot it down and look at it later, it's Mark 4. And Paul, I mean, Jesus here is talking about different soils, talking about different people and analogy there. And he says, there's this third soil. There's this one soil. And this is the one that always makes me think, oh, Lord, this is the one that so often gets me and the people that I look at. It says, a life that doesn't fall through, follow through. Why? He said this, the cares of this world. You know, does all the other stuff. The deceitfulness of riches. The thing that say, you know, this will make you happy if you just go get that. And the desires for other things. This is what it says. It comes in and chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. Now, he's not saying there that that person doesn't have a relationship with God or anything else. It just says they never reach their full fruitfulness. It's another way of saying, hey, they didn't, they didn't really complete the stroke. They didn't follow through. They started, but they didn't finish because everything else got in the way. And, and there was that intention, but not the action to follow it. And maybe that's the problem there. That so often happens in people's lives. You'll see it in verse 12 and the following verses. That maybe they were wanting to do something so big, so impressive, that they didn't do anything at all. Ever, ever had that where you're like, okay, I'm going to somehow make a million dollars and give it to the Lord. And you're like, really? He's, he wasn't asking for that. Um, you see verse 12, he says, if there's a willing mind, it's accepted and according to what one has, and not according to what he doesn't have. For I don't mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but an equality, that now at this time your abundance might supply their lack, and their abundance somewhere down the road would supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it's written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, over. he who gathered little had no lack. Now, Again, looking at this, Paul is making sure that they don't misunderstand his message, and it's important for us not to do the same, or not to misunderstand it here tonight. He's saying, you know what? Another sports analogy, don't overcorrect. You know, if, if a person says, okay, follow through, and you see a person like, you know, follow through so much that they're like throwing the racket out the door, or they're, you know, swinging, they fall down or whatever, and he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's the thing, you gotta, you gotta not hyperextend. 
You know, don't go out and borrow money to give to the Lord. I've known people who've done, you know, debt donations. And, 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 you know, yes, it's true. As a church, this year we started accepting as one of the ways that people can donate here credit cards. But we talked about it and we prayed about it and we said, you know what, Lord, one thing we want to make very, very clear here. We don't anyone, want anyone to give what they do not have on a credit card. And if you're giving beyond what you could pay off in a month, you don't have it. You know, you can't give it. You don't have it. And I know uh, cases where a pastor encouraged people to take faith loans, you know, to believe God, you know, put it on that card and believe God that he's going to do it. Listen, you know what? In the end, it was a big failure. It was a big fiasco, and God didn't honor it. Why? Because it's not in alignment with his word. He never honors what is not in alignment with his word. And a lot of angry people and bitter people, unbelievers and believers alike, very bad witness to the community. And Paul isn't saying here, you know what? You guys should give what you do not have. No, he's saying, I'm not saying that the rich should become poor so that the poor over there in Jerusalem now are living high on the hug. He's saying, you know, just basic necessity. I'm just saying, use the grace that God has given you to make a difference in somebody's life. See that quote from the Old Testament there, it's about manna. It's in verse 15 there. It talks about manna. It says, you know, the one who gathered a lot didn't gather too much. The one who gathered a little didn't gather too little. And this was the thing. It was kind of funny. Manna was from God to begin with. You know, they, they couldn't make manna. It fell from the heavens. You know, it was something that they actually got. And they were to go out and gather it. But there were some people who said, more manna, 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 manna. We're going to make manna banana bread. You know, we're going to have a you know, manna cotti. We're going to have it all, you know. <laughs> but this is what happened. It, it grew worms. It grew worms. And God said, no, I wasn't giving you more success in your gathering so that you could have more manna. It was to make sure that everyone here would have enough. That some guy's out there working hard and maybe he's not as good at scooping the manna and he's, his family's hungry. Hey, cool. Here you go. And I like to think of uh, examples, you know, just to think about them, hoarding and all the rest. Pinatas. Now, who thought of that? Who came up with the idea of a pinata at a kid's party? I mean, here's what happens, basically, you know. You get a bunch of kids coked up. I'm talking about, you know, Coca-Cola. <laughs> you get them coked up and caked up, you know. They're just sugar rush big time. And then you blindfold a kid and you give him a baseball bat. And you say, okay, kid, follow through. You know, just whack that. And they're up there, whoo, you know, and parents cheering them on and everything else. And, and you start thinking about that. And there's now a nonviolent version, I suppose. I've seen those, you know, where you just pull the strings and that sort of thing. Take some of the fun out. But there's still the fight afterwards. No matter what, you're not going to take the fight out of the kids. And they're just piling up the candy as fast as possible. And, you know, I'm in there and I'm getting stuff for my kids and all the rest. And there's always that one kid, you know, who's smaller and younger than everybody else. And I shove him to the back and, you know, there's just no way he's going to get it. And meanwhile, you know, they're, they're just crying and, and there's just bags bulging. And there's one kid who's got just nothing there at all. And God looking on at that would say, Scott, could you give something out of your bulging bag to that little kid, you know? Could you maybe not be such a hoarder. And so you see in verse 16, he says, thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, you might want to just mark that in some way, that little phrase, we'll come back to it. He says, he went to you of his own accord. This was his idea. And he says, and we sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of God himself and to show your ready mind. Avoiding this, there's something to avoid here. Verse 20, he says, that any would, would blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but in the sight of men. You know, sometimes people have a sort of self-righteous attitude that says, only God can judge me. No, that's not really true. You know, God has called us to live lives that are honorable, even among men, that if people do have an accusation against us, it's a false accusation. And so principle number four is that responsibility follows opportunity. Responsibility follows opportunity. And you'll see all the way along with all of these that there's a, a cyclical nature to them, that, that if you're given an opportunity and you're responsible with that, you'll be given more opportunity. You know, if you're given grace and you give that grace, 
you'll be given more opportunity to give grace. All the way through all of these things, the, God is one that you'll never outgive in any area of life. But when God gives you an opportunity, it's such an important thing to see that God is also giving us a responsibility that goes with it. An opportunity, a place of honor, a privilege. And you know what? I think Calvary Chapel Kindle, in my opinion, is in an, a place of great honor and privilege and opportunity. I mean, I look at this and I say, Lord, we don't deserve it, but we sure do desire it. We sure do have a, a gratitude for it. You know, every week, every week I get to see people give their lives to the Lord in abundance. I, I mean, Vernon's always coming to me and saying, we need more new believers Bibles. We need more new believers Bibles. You know, and I, wow, didn't we just order? Yeah, but they're, they're getting saved. People are getting saved. What an opportunity. But it comes, of course, with a responsibility. And you see this unnamed brother here, verse 19, who was chosen by the churches to administer a gift. He had a reputation somehow for responsibility. And a question Jesus asked at, in the scriptures was, listen, if you can't be faithful with financial things, which really don't matter that much on the grand scale, how could I possibly entrust you with true spiritual responsibilities? And so he's talking there about follow through, that when there's an opportunity, I need to be having that responsibility, being honorable. And you see here multiple people involved with it. Why is that? Because you know what? The more people you get involved overseeing something, it's one thing for one person to be carrying around cash. The temptation is pretty high. But I used to work in Coral Gables and I would, would see uh, two meter people checking the meters and I used to think, that's so wasteful. There's my tax dollars being wasted. And then I read an article about how they had to go to two People, because they used to have one guy and your tax dollars were being wasted. The guy's, you know, emptying the change right in the pocket. But when there's two of them and they mix them up all the time, they weren't having the same amount of theft. So what is that? Controls. Controls keep honest people honest. And we have controls here. We have a board meeting tomorrow. We have accountability. And thank God for that. It's very important because we have a lot of opportunity and a lot of responsibility. And I love how it says here that this guy often proved diligent. Verse 17, verse 22, it says it again in so many different ways. Read it with me. It says there in verse 22, we have sent with them our brother whom we have often proved diligent in many things. I mean, he wasn't just responsible in one area. It's like anything they did, what else you need? Done well. He says, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence we have in you. In other words, he, think, he says, I think when we get to Corinthians, uh, there's going to be quite a bit to be responsible for. He says, if anyone inquires about Titus, he's my partner. He's my fellow worker concerning you. And if our brethren are inquired about, they're the messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and our boasting on your behalf. Now there, as, as it ends up that chapter, the first part of this two-part uh, section, Paul is vouching for the financial faithfulness, for the personal integrity of Titus. Now, they could believe Paul. Why? Because Paul also had proved himself to be a very diligent guy. And so they could trust his word about Titus because they could trust his word. And the reason was that Paul and Titus and the rest of these guys, they were well known for follow-through. Again, a person gains a reputation over time because of a long history of behavior in a certain direction. Often proved diligent. It says, faithful in, in the little, they gave him a little task and he did it. Faithful in the much. They gave him a big responsibility and by God's grace he did it. And you know, again, in life it's so easy to start things. You know, start a ministry, start a marriage, start this, start that, be a parent. You know, the, the getting started on the parenting thing is is quite fun. And then there's uh, some other things that are, you know, a little more difficult along the way. But it's so easy to start. And the key in life, you know, the true test of a person is follow through. Now, I want to close with a story. It's a lesson I'm learning right now. And these are the, you know, the fresh ones. I, I, I'm not teaching because I know everything. I'm teaching because I'm learning and because God is showing me these things. And he sometimes has some very painful lab sessions for me. What is the one that we're learning right now? A bathroom remodeling. Now, some of you are thinking, what are you doing remodeling your bathroom in the middle of the giving thing? Shouldn't you be, you know, doing something? Listen, this one was involuntary, Okay. Now, if you've never done a major repair, that's the real word here, major repair, 
while you're still living in the house. Well, you, if you've never done that, there's no way for me to adequately explain the abject horror of it all. Okay, there's just no way for me to adequately explain it and you wouldn't believe me. But if you've done it, I don't need to say much more. All I need to say is home improvement, you know, bathroom remodel or whatever, and you already know. But it started nice enough. You know, it was, it was, it was kind of easy at the very beginning. You know, this couple from here came over for dinner, nice couple, having a great time with them, everything else. And he's one of those uh, handy guys and all the rest. And so we're enjoying the chicken dinner and we're talking about God and all the rest and cool things going on. And then he starts staring at the ceiling all of a sudden. I'm thinking, man, he's bored. And he asks a question. He says, do you have a leak? Did you have a leak here? I said, not that I know of. There's a little spot on the... On the on the ceiling there, you know, it's discolored. And I thought, oh, yeah, well, yeah, you're right, it is, you know. So we go upstairs. He says, show me. He, he looks down on the floor. He tugs at a tile on the shower. He goes, kind of kicks it with his foot, does this, and the tile falls out. Now behind it, uh, instantly there's a smell that comes out from behind that, if you've ever smelled that moisture, mold, just bleh, you know. And I, I stuck my hand in there, and it's like oatmeal. I mean, just oatmeal, black oatmeal. I'm like, oh, wonderful. Now, I could have just stuck that tile back and said, you know, do, is there like something I can do to seal that? You know, and just, well, there we go. Ignore the issue. That's what a lot of us do. And that would be no follow through, right? But it turns out we had a problem, a longstanding problem since before. It was there before we moved in. We'd lived in the house now six years down in the homestead area. And it was never done right. I mean, as we've taken it apart now, we've seen it was never done right. And so this is the thing. that You find out who your friends are at times like this. He said, you know what? I'll help you fix it. I'll help you fix it. He didn't just point out the problem and say, ooh, you got a problem, see ya. You know, no. <laughs> we're in it together. Now, once you're in, if you've ever done these things, you're all in. Why is that? Because, you know, you gotta, now you've got to tear out the tile. We, we break out the tile. There's the problem behind it. Behind it, sheetrock's all messed up. Okay. Got to fix the sheet right. Whoa, you look at the studs. Man, the studs are corroded. Oh, man, this is, uh, you know, it did, okay. Whew. Now, you expose the pipes and you go, wow, these, these faucets are terrible. I mean, whoever did this work, it's, it's leaky, it's bad, it's cheap, you know. And so we're committed to the place, you know. We're here for the long haul. And so the first part was so much fun. I got to tell you, it was so much fun. Didn't cost anything. I mean, this is my favorite part. Sledgehammers and crowbars. I mean, all right. You know, and so we're just, wow, you know, why in there, you want that to go, yeah, get that out of there, you know, whoa. And this guy said something so profound along the way, in between, you know, whacking things with the, with the sledgehammer. Sometimes it has to get ugly before it gets pretty. So, man, I am learning a lot, Lord. Now, I'm learning a lot physically, spiritually, emotionally, all through this, you know. We get down to the plywood, the metal studs, all the rest, start the rebuilding process. And I go, oh, wow, this isn't as much fun. I, you know, I, I don't like this part. This is the part where I get my wallet out and go to the, the Home Depot and start getting new things, you know. And, and frustrations and discouragement along the way. And again, if you've ever done this, you know what I'm talking about. But I just want to give you a couple of ones. They're, they're kind of funny. Sand, sanding drywall. Anyone who's ever done that? I, I don't need to say any more. But it's like you're in one of those snow globes. You know, those little things they shake up and it's Miami. You know, that's what our bathroom looks like. I just shake up the snow globe and I'm in there. And, I, and you know, I get all that done. And, and he looks at me and says, okay, two more times of that and we should be ready to go. Two more times, you know. I just cleaned up everything. And, then, you know, my wife's clothes in the closet are just all, everything's dusty. So if you see her and she looks kind of dusty, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> And, and you think about that, my hands around the sanding pole like this, you know, I, I, like the sand on the sanding pole and everything. I came in Saturday, Sunday to play the drums and I couldn't really move my hands beyond this. It's like Pat just sticks the sticks in like this, you know, and I'm playing the drums, you know, and that, that's a back to the sanding pole, you know. And then every step of the way has just been unbelievable. I mean, it, one of the trips on the, on the way to the, to the store, there was a rollover accident right in front of us, you know, and, and this guy jumps out and, and the lady's upside down in the car and everything. I'm just like, what is going on with this, with this project? And one more example that I got to tell you. A cabinet. This is the one, uh, hopefully uh, tomorrow maybe is, is the day. You know, I'm having to do these like, 45 minutes at a time. Like, I, I, literally, 4 o'clock in the morning the other day, I was up chipping uh, glue off of marble slab things so we could reuse them, you know, and stuff like that. And every step, you know, 
But this cabinet, the box said requires a 48 inch opening. I trusted the box. <laughs> the opening in the bathroom, we measured it several times, 48 inches, cool. 48 inches requires a 48 inch opening, that's good. They would say 49 if they meant it, yeah. They would say 49 if they meant it, 48 inches. So we get this huge thing up the stairs. I should say he did. He got the huge thing up the stairs. <laughs> Out of the box, you know, that's the big thing. And we measure the actual cabinet. You know, now it's time to measure the actual cabinet. 48 and a half. <laughs> All right, a half. Well, how bad can a half be? Well, we, we go in there and we re start realizing there's no way you're going to be able to get this in that opening. I mean, it's all tile. There's, there's just no way that it's going to get in there. You know, you start moving things around. I'm, you know, envisioning sledgehammers and crowbars again. You know, no, we're not going back there. And you would say, well, just return it. What's the big thing? Put it back in the box. Well, you know what happens to boxes in houses that have kids? They become forts. So there's Carissa in the box of the thing, having drawn all over the inside of the box, fortunately the inside, you know, when they finally look at that, they're going to say, what was that? But she's, she's whining and crying as it's going out, that, my fort, my fort, you know, and I'm like, we may just end up living in a box, you know, maybe we'll just live in this box, that's okay. But we go back to the store after I finally find the receipt. You know, the, by this point, finding just the receipt is in a pile, you know, of receipts and everything else. And, uh, and, and so we're, we're talking with the lady and she says, oh, I'm sorry, this has already been returned. No, it hasn't. That was the first time we came here and, and you charged us wrong and then we had to return it. And, blah, blah, and we're d going through this whole discussion. And right then uh, there's a lady rolling down the aisle of the place, the 36 inch cabinet that we need, the last one that we need. Now you should have seen Lynn at this point. I mean her follow through was incredible. She just punched that lady and <laughs> right through, right through the lady. Just power and accuracy. No, that's not what happened by God's grace. But see, I, I know this. I'm usually one of those people who just pushes through the obstacles. You know, it's just part of how God has made me. You know, but this project has just made me want to board up the door to that and say, you know what? We're just going to shower with the hose, kids. That's the way it is. <laughs> You know, the dog does it outside, we're going to figure a way to do the same thing, you know. But part of it has been this friend who's just followed through, just at each stage, and hey, we can do it. We can do it. We can do it together. And he didn't just point out the problem. He's willing to be there to solve it with me. And, and along the way, God's been saying to me, you know what, I'm that friend too. I'm that friend. And Scott, it is all about follow through in life, and it's not always going to be easy. In every area of life, you're going to have to learn that lesson to follow through as a father, to follow through as a husband, to follow through as a pastor. And even when you've fallen, there's still a way to get back up and follow through. How? Well, just follow. Just follow. See, follow Jesus through, through the good, through the bad, through the ugly. And yes, sometimes in our life, it does have to get ugly before it gets pretty. Sometimes it gets uglier before it gets pretty. But Philippians 1.6 says something so beautiful. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. What that means is God's never going to look at you and say, well, we just got to board this one up and give up on it. And again, it's so easy to start, but our character is tested and proven in those moments when God is saying, hey, Scott, this is one of those times for a follow-through. And following through that great trial of affliction, maybe. And on the other side of that, and even through it, an abundance of joy. That's the opportunity, and that's the responsibility. What is it? Well, as we close, this is the opportunity we give every time we meet, which is an opportunity for anyone in the room who's never made a commitment to Christ to do that. And see, here's the thing. God will finish every project that he starts. But the thing is, he will not force somebody to start. He's not going to force a person to make that decision, but he's going to give the opportunity. But with every opportunity comes a responsibility. What is that responsibility? It's the response. And so you might be here today and you say, well, you know, I'd love to follow through, but in my life I haven't followed through. Well, listen, Jesus followed through for you on the cross. And he's calling you to a response to that. That's the responsibility you have. How do you do it? Well, we're going to close our eyes. We're going to pray, close in prayer. And I'm just going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand. By raising your hand, you're acknowledging your need for a Savior, for a Lord, for a friend. A friend who would say, you know what, we got some remodeling to, to do in your life. And yeah, it could get ugly before it gets pretty. 
but I'm not going to ever leave you or forsake you along the process, and I'm never going to give up on you. But you have to start. You have to be willing. That's the part that comes first. So by raising your hand, that's what you'd be saying. So let's go ahead and pray. I'll give you that opportunity there at the end. Father, I thank you for those here in this room who know what it is to walk with you, to go through the ups and downs of life with you, to go through maybe some deep afflictions and some deep poverty and some uh, challenges, Lord, but to know it with you. But I pray especially now for those who maybe have gone through some difficult things and some challenging things in life, but have done it or tried to do it alone. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here in this room who needs to make a commitment to you, who needs to come into that first contact with you, because we can't follow through what we never started. Just a decision to follow you. If there's anyone here tonight who needs to make that decision, as we give this opportunity, I pray that they would do their part, which is simply to respond to your offer of grace. And so now with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, if there's anyone here in this room who wants to make that decision, that declaration tonight, hey, I need Jesus in my life. I don't want to live another day without him. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you right where you're sitting to raise your hand, get it up high so I can see it. If that's you saying, I want to make a commitment to Christ here tonight. Anybody here? Just raise your hand. By saying that, you're saying, I want forgiveness. I want God's grace. I need him in my life. Anybody at all here tonight? I see you there in the back. God bless you. Anyone else? For you who raised your hand, I'm just going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. It's a prayer of commitment to Christ and asking of him into your life and into your heart and into your life for that remodeling that only he can do. Jesus, I thank you for your gift of grace. I open my heart and I invite you inside. I want you to be my Lord, my Savior, and my friend. Forgive me of my sin and wash me clean. I want to follow you. I want to follow through, but I want to follow you all the days of my life. From this day forward, Lord, may I always know that you are with me. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.